Good evening everybody, it's Kate here from the Safeguarding Association and welcome to tonight's procedural pointers. As always, if you're here live, um, say hello, leave a comment. Um, if you like the video, give it a like. Um, I like it, love her, so that'd be really nice as well. Um, and if you've got any questions, please leave them in the comments below and I will do my best to answer them as we go through the uh, video and as we go through the um, this evening's procedural pointers. So tonight we're talking about working with people who have um, who are struggling with their mental health. And we're talking, most of this week is going to be around the mental health um, awareness because it is Mental Health Awareness Week. And there are a few things to consider when you're working with someone who's suffering in terms of their mental health, particularly when you're working within the child protection arena. The first thing is that just because someone's suffering with their mental health doesn't mean that they're unable to engage, to work with professionals or to fully partake within the proceedings. It's all about making sure that you're including them in a way that allows them to participate fully. So because somebody is suffering maybe from depression or anxiety doesn't mean that they aren't able to engage. However, what it does mean is that the way we work with people may change slightly. So if we think about um, the way that we, we deal with mental health, I certainly have had in the past, and I know other people who've had as well, um, the the attitude of well they just need to get on with it or you need to pull your socks up or um well if they can't get out of bed then that's their own problem and we'll deal with that accordingly whereas in reality um it's it's much more complex than that and as professionals we have to be aware that the decisions that we make have huge impacts on families and where possible we need to adapt the way we work in order to allow people to fully engage in the process. Now I'm not saying for a second that we need to completely change the way that we work but we do need to adapt sometimes the way that we operate and the way that we work to make sure that we've given um, families and we've given parents in particular and carers the best possible opportunity of ensuring that the children can remain within their families for as long as possible. Because remember, the ultimate outcome here could be that children are taken away from their families and are adopted elsewhere. And that's not the ultimate goal here. What we're trying to do is keep families together. So sometimes we have to alter the way we're working in order to make sure that we can include the family as best as we possibly can. So thinking about that, if you have somebody who is struggling, then a conversation is key and making sure that you understand how they're struggling. Now that may come from their GP. It may come from the person themselves if they feel able to articulate it. It may come from somebody else. If you're a professional working in this arena, I would love to know your top tips for, for engaging with professionals in this arena. I'm coming at this from a place of um, professionals where we've maybe tried everything or we think we've tried everything. Um, hi, Colin. Hi, Fiona. Um, we maybe think we've tried everything, but actually, in reality, there are some steps that we've maybe not taken, either because we weren't aware of them or because they, we felt they were out of timescales. So the first thing is have that conversation, work out what your baseline is, what's happening, what's going on, um, make sure that they can have that conversation with you as well or a trusted person. Then work out what your expectations are. How are you going to manage things? How are you going to sort things? What are you going to be doing? Um, how are you going to be engaging as well as possible with them? If, however, so that's really where we're talking with people who are struggling maybe with depression or anxiety. It's being open. It's having that conversation. It's being very aware of, of how their depression affects them 
And if someone doesn't get in touch with you for three days, then maybe picking up the phone again and having that conversation to see how you're able to best manage it. Are you able to alter premises to help somebody um, have that assessment session? Maybe if they're anxious about meeting a new person, then is there somebody they can bring with them to, to help out with that? If they're really, really struggling, then a level of understanding. But I am very, very aware here that if somebody is suffering to such a degree that they're not able to function and they're not able to meet the welfare needs of their child, that's exactly why the local authority is intervening. So if somebody is being given every opportunity and is being given every bit of support available and they're still not able to engage, then that's the time when local authorities are stepping things up because there is a problem because their mental health is impacting their ability to meet the welfare needs of their child or children. So in moving on into terms of a diagnosis, maybe of something like um, schizophrenia or um, bipolar, where people really do struggle. Again, it's making sure that you are using the right tools. As professionals, we have a wealth of tools available to us and we have to choose the right tool for the right job. We have a whole range of skills and we need to make sure we're using them. Just because somebody suffers from schizophrenia or bipolar does not necessarily mean they're unable to care for their child or children. It's about their support networks. It's about making sure that when they are going for assessments we are we're looking at at all of those different angles we're using all the tools that we've got to make sure that we're assessing things as best we possibly can now depending on your role you might not be the best person to assess whether somebody is suffering or to assess whether somebody is even able to meet the needs of their child that could be another professional involved who will make those decisions if it's outside of your area of expertise don't do it. Do not put yourself in that position. It's not fair on you and it's certainly not fair on the person that you're working with. Again, a bit like um, where somebody is struggling more generally with their mental health, it's about having a conversation. It's about them, if they've been through treatment for schizophrenia and they're through the other side and their medication is working, that's not necessarily a bar to them being able to look after their children in the long term. I see time and time again within assessments, within reports, that maybe there's, there's a comment made that somebody 10 or 12 years ago um, suffered from depression. And one of my um, colleagues likened it to saying, well, somebody 10 or 12 years ago broke their arm, but they received treatment and they are fine to use that arm. Just because somebody went through a period of depression 10 or 12 years ago does not necessarily mean that that depression is going to reappear. Now, some people are prone to breaking bones. Some people are prone to having different bouts of, of depression or anxiety or other mental health concerns. But we have to make sure that we're taking each period in turn and we're taking each period at the current time. We can't be relying on something that happened several years ago to inform or to, to make a judgment on whether something's going to happen in the future, because that's not necessarily how this works. So it's making sure that we are conscious of the decision, the, deci the decision, that's easy for me to say. It's making sure we're conscious of the decisions we are making. Are we making them based on information that we have available to us now? Or are we making them on the basis of information about a person's past? Because what happened in the past doesn't, yes, we all talk about the past informs the future, but actually, where are we sitting now? On this timeline, remember it's a continuum, where are they sitting? Are they actually okay now? What support do they have in place? What methods of coping do they have? How are they managing all of this? And in most cases, people manage it really well. We all have mental health. Just how are we managing it? Do they know where to go if they start to struggle? Do they know who to call upon? If so, should we really be relying on mental health as a reason why 
we'd be escalating in child protection processes? Probably not. But again, we've got to look at the rest of the context with things. But really importantly, when we're dealing with people with mental, who have suffering with their mental health, we cannot make a judgment based solely on that. We have to look at the situation as it stands in the present. And we need to have that honest conversation about how they're managing, about what the expectations are, and about how we can best help them as professionals in order that we can progress any assessment or any work with that, fa that child, family, or, um, or carer, so that we are doing our best by way of the family and we're doing everything we can to make sure we've covered that i will add here that if we don't do that and if the process ends up being escalated through to court proceedings the judge is going to start to scrutinize what happened previously not least because if a parent feels or a carer feels they've been unfairly treated they're going to raise that with their solicitor and they're going to raise that and say we've ended up here because i wasn't assessed properly in the beginning and so work's going to need to be redone and so if you are a professional who's been involved in providing information your reports your assessments your decision making can be heavily scrutinized within the court arena so it's really important that while we've got the time we're making sure that we're doing it properly to begin with and we're giving them the best opportunity to move on any comments or questions please leave them in the comments below if you've enjoyed tonight's procedural pointers please have a, a like if you've got any questions about anything i've raised then please leave them in the comments and tag me in them. Use the hashtag Ask Kate, um, and I will do my best to answer them as always. Until tomorrow, have a lovely evening. Bye.